Guerra, and I'm living the low life. Today on Living the Low Life, we're going to the Grand National Roadster Show, where hot rodders and low riders learn that they have a whole lot in common. Us being a low rider club, with the hot rods, with the roadsters, we're all one. We'll follow the Lifestyles Low Rider Club as they prepare to compete at a show known for outrageous hot rods and customs. Here's a, here's oh, a fun car for you. And we'll see how low riding has earned respect at one of the most important custom car shows on earth. It's never been better for low riders than it is right now. It's the car show they call the granddaddy of them all. And once you're here, you'll know exactly why that's the case. It's fun, it's fantastic, and Vita's here to show us around. Hi, I'm Vita Guerra, and today I'm living the low life. We're at the Grand National Roadster Show, where your car can be fast and flashy, or it can be low and slow. But it wasn't always low and slow at this show. That's all changed, and to many, it's a natural progression. To me, it's no surprise that you see low riders here. I think one of the reasons why low riders early on weren't all that accepted at, at regular hot rod shows, because there was kind of a chasm between the two camps. Legendary low rider Joe Ray has lived the journey. Prejudice, stereotyping, it's all the same. And the barriers get broken when you have shows exactly like this, when you have hot rods and low riders together. That's how you break those barriers. Hot rodders like Pete Chaporis and Larry Watson know the score, seeing what goes into these low riders. I have so much respect for what they do. My favorite building is with the low rider custom cars. Do you believe that? If you've arrived to show a ride, you know it took a lot of prep to get here. Just ask the guys from Lifestyles Car Club. This club knows what it takes when it comes to getting ready for the granddaddy of them all. They also know just where to go to make it all shine. We're here now, we're at uh, Primo Restoration in Cucamonga. It's a small little shop here. We've been here for 12 years. Today we're gonna be getting some of the cars ready for the National Roadster Show, especially my brother's car. It's never fired up before. We'll try and get that running today. Every time we go to the car show, we always either go to a shop or, you know, this time around we came to a pre restoration shop where we came and get the cars going, got a crew of about 20 guys. Uh, we're going to clean the cars, wax them, arm around, whatever it is we take to prep the cars to get to the show. There's a lot of work involved here, a lot of work, and, uh, the people that we have here, we have many friends here, many friends that are here to give a hand to make sure that everything's a go for the show. Well, today we have to we have to clean the undercarriage and clean some of the motor and adjust some of the hydraulic system in the back and stuff. I wanted to drive over there, but since it hasn't been on the road yet, it's basically everything's brand new on it. I don't want to take a chance. Uh, you never know, it's hard to tell sometimes. Hey, do we have gas in the gas? <laughs> I think I put gas. That's a good question. We'll be in there. I'm pretty sure we'll, we could handle it. We'll be there. Meanwhile, as the cars get ready, Vita sees how the show gets ready. It's a car show where I feel that uh, it's not an easy show to, to compete because you are against some of the best hot rods out there. And those guys, I top my hat to those guys. Those guys sure know how to build a car. And knowing that a lot of the old timers, the grandfather guys, being the one, the best, and I heard the guy Larry Watson gonna be there, I wish and I hope I have a privilege to meet him at the Hot Rod Show. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a great show, and I think that we're gonna do good, and I think people out there are really gonna get to know what lifestyle really is all about. with Rick from the Lifestyles Car Club as he prepares for his trip to the Grand National Roadster Show. Oh, 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 oh. 
I hear this is the first time your car has been in the Ab show? Absolutely. This is my first time this is here at the Grand Nationals. I mean, I, I just completed it about a year ago. So what does it take to get into the Grand National? Well, actually, I guess it takes, you got to have a flawless car. Flawless is the word. The price tags on some of these cars can reach deep into the seven-figure range. So what is Lifestyle's presence going to be this year? Well, actually, this year we're showing uh, we're showing about, about 10 cars because they only allow you to have a certain amount of cars. And what we're going to have today, when we get there, will be all new cars that have never showed this event. So how did you prepare the car for this show? Well, actually, it took me a lot of hours. It took me because I built this platform for this show. It's going to be like a pedestal that the car sits on top of in its uh, wall to wall mirrors. You're going to see every square inch of the bottom of the car. Oh, and and wow. that's what they want to see. People want to see exactly what's going on with this car. Mm -hmm. and, from uh, all angles. From all angles. Rick's not the only one making it all ready. Nearby, the entire show gets put together. Right now, they're getting ready for the big opening, so let's see how they make it happen. Hey, bro, go for what you know. Bass get low as we rock the show. Hey, bro, go for what you know. Bass get low as we rock the show. Cars come from all across the country for this show. Owners and builders know that this is the place to have your creation on display. Vita's ready to get the scoop from show organizer John Buck. So tell me a little bit about the history of the Grand National Roadster Show. The Grand National Roadster Show started in Oakland in 1950 by a, a guy by the name Al Sloniker and his wife Mary. And um, they started the show as a kind of, they wanted to have a concourse, Pebble Beach, high-end Ferrari uh, type of, of event. Well, they couldn't fill the buildings in, in 1949 with enough of those high-end cars. So Al got on the phone with his buddies and said, hey, can you bring a couple of those you know, hot rod cars over? Which is a bad word back then. These are rebels. Well, when the attendants and the folks started coming into the show, they gravitated toward the hot rod side and not some of these more foofy cars, mm -hmm. collector's cars. You know? mm -hmm. So instantly, the very next year in 1950, the National Roadster Show was started. And even back in those very early years, the Grand National Roadster Show quickly attracted many of the top names in the world of hot rods and custom cars. Guys like Blackie Jajian, who won in 1955 with his little roadster that he used to have three guys help pick up so that he could show the undercarriage of the car. He was the first guy to chrome the undercarriage of the car and put it in the show. And so these guys were breaking their backs every hour picking the car up to show off this undercarriage until a, a lady walks up and says, why are you doing that? So to show it up, he says, well, why don't you just put a mirror under there? It'd be a lot easier on the back. They did put the mirror under the car, propped it up with a coffee can, and there you have it. Now you've got mirrors on every show car showcasing that undercarriage yeah. and how much detail and work go into these vehicles. So while the show has been around for a long time, the introduction of lowriders is something that's relatively new. So how have the lowriders been incorporated into the Roadster show? When we moved the show down from Oakland to Pomona, which was five years ago, mm -hmm. you know, we're in Southern California car culture here, yeah. and the lowrider is so important to our culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, the clubs that are involved here, as you can see the cars pouring behind us, uh -huh. they're just phenomenal vehicles, and it's part of our history. As we prepare for the Grand National Roadster Show, Vita checks out all the action. Let's go talk to some of the lowriders that made it here today. You yeah. have us on the TV. Yep, living the low life. Ah. So what more do you have to do to get this car set up? Oh, uh, this one's pretty much done because this is just a street car. You know, there's no undercarriage. But you know, that's in the future plans to do it all up like some of the other cars that you see here that are off the wheels on jack stands. Nearby, our friend from Lifestyles Car Club is just about ready. The debut of his latest lowrider is right around the corner. So I'm here with Rick again, and you weren't kidding when you said this is a beauty. Well, I, I told you, I mean, there's a lot of work and a lot of time, and I got my crew here getting it together, so 
It's looking good. So far, so good. It's coming along just the way I planned. Do you think you're going to take any trophies? You know, the judges looked at your car. Well, there's a lot of competition here, so it's really hard to say. I mean, uh, all we can do is ask the guy above. Come on, man. <laughs> and, <laughs> Give me uh, a break. Keep, yeah, keep our fingers crossed. That's all. To grasp the size of this whole operation, let's talk again to head man John Buck. So, John, give me a tour of this building since oh, we're here. Like we said, we're in the clubhouse, and we're just getting started up. On the side of the clubhouse, we got the, the Lifestyles whoa, Car whoa. Club, a really great group of guys. Mm -hmm. Southern California culture at its finest when it comes to lowriders. I know there's nine buildings, so you still have to show me, right? Oh, absolutely. Let's go take a tour. All right, let's go. From traditional hot rods to vintage dragsters, the cars at this show are dripping in history. Hey, Vito, remember earlier I was telling you about Black Eugene who mm -hmm. had the little 55 winner? This is it right here. Oh, wow. First car to get that undercarriage chromed, and they literally would pick that up, show that car off. And his name is on our big perpetual trophy. It's over nine and a half feet tall, and it'll be there forever. He's a legend in our industry. And speaking of a legend, this car was actually built by George Barris, and Blackie had a lot to do with. This is the a la carte. John Mumford, who now owns this car, has done an incredible job restoring it mm -hmm. and completely renovate the way that this car was. And if you look there, there's Barris's name and Blackie's name, who was in the car behind us there, that mm -hmm. started this whole hot rodding thing. Barris is known for cars like the Batmobile and Munster Coach, but he was also influenced by low riding. My father was a suit suitor, and they rolled together. It's passion, you know, that's where we came from, and that's where I feel the Latinos are. They're passionate, blooded people, like we are. So you know what, you either got it or you don't. They got it. Let's take a trip to the old school. Now we're getting into the 60s, man. There was some funky stuff going yeah, on. Yeah, what that. type of car Two is motors. This? this is actually an AMB, America's Most Beautiful Roadster winner back in the 60s. Same with a green one called the Alien behind it. As we walk back through time into the 70s, you get some real fun cars. Here's oh, a, here's a fun that. car for you. This was built by a very famous man named Joe Balon, but this is his barbershop car. And as you see, pretty fun, fun time building that. And in the 70s, you found a lot of things like that. Check this out. You can easily see how closely related the lowrider interiors are to these iconic hot rods from this era. So it seems that lowriders and hot rods have similar origins, is that correct? Absolutely. There's more to see here at the show, including some amazing paint you won't want to miss. Graphics, pinstriping, candy colors are all staples in the world of lowriding, but it all started with a different kind of car in mind. Years ago, custom cars began to define themselves with amazing paint jobs. Uh, this is a 1960 Starliner that our shop built. As you can see, it has a, a panel-style paint job. It's like a Larry Watson-influenced paint job. Larry Watson. Now that's a name you'll hear a lot around here, whether you're a lowrider or a hot rodder like the great Pete Chaporis. Biggest influence I can remember on my life at the time was Larry Watson. I'm Larry Watson. I started my painting career in 1955 by pinstriping cars. The other striper that gave me competition was Von Dutch. And then I came along like a bubble gummer with zitters and pimples and started pinstriping customs in Artesia and Bellflower area. And that's what brought me up. His work was clean, colorful, and totally original. In the 60s, as a matter of fact, at the time when Larry Watson was doing all his custom work, he started really the panel painting and things like that. A lot of the custom paint work was getting to the extreme. And then as the muscle cars came in, the custom painting kind of faded away. And at that time, the Latinos with the low riders kind of went right into it and picked it up. And one of the reasons was simple. It was a cost-effective way to modify your ride. So you think about it. A lot of guys didn't have money. They had to do stuff on their own, which meant they had to go to something that they could afford, paint. So it's easier to paint a car than spend thousands of dollars on bodywork. And you got to understand something. In the 60s and 70s, paint was relatively inexpensive because you didn't have all the high-end paints that you have now. You had lacquer, you had enamel. That was it. And it was cheap. I remember buying supplies for a car to paint it, 500 bucks. Hey, it looks like our pal Lewis got his wish to meet Larry Watson. Oh, on the uh, lowrider, who is the number one painter that does all, does 
copies my work from the 50s. Gilbert, Gilbert Melendez. Gilbert, Gilbert, Gilbert. Gilbert, Gilbert it's an old school painter like yourself. Okay, yeah, he's very well, not that old. I, mean, I know you're a legend, but I'm not. You know. You're a legend. You're, our eyes are legends. That's well, what I we're appreciate here. that. Yeah. <laughs> it's your <laughs> turn to keep the trend going. Yeah, we'll leave right. And I'm proud of you guys. Right. Thank you. Many lowriders and hot rods share similar aspects of design, including, of course, the all-important stance. When I was a kid and hanging out at Larry's shop, we lowered the cars straight down and tipped them slightly to the front. It's called a French rake. And that's what, what the guys in Southern California were doing. And a lot of our uh, Hispanic friends would do the same thing, only they would drop the back down with fender skirts, which became tail draggers. And uh, that was really, the, the, if you wanted to call it a difference, it was very subtle, but it was a difference. I don't care if you pull your coil out or put a cement block. If your car's touching the ground, I don't care if it's hydraulic, airbags, or you threw out your coils, it's on the floor now. You may be wondering how they judge these incredible cars. I don't know, so let's find out. Tell me the A through Z of judging, because okay. I know it, it entails a lot. So. Okay, well, now in this place, we're judging 300 cars. So what I normally do, we have a judging sheet and each category in it, like engine, paint, body work, and that has numbers next to it. And then we add them up at the end, and we get one, two, and three. And with so much to look at with these low riders, the judging becomes more difficult than ever. It's hard on the judges, but it's good for the world of low riding. It's never been better for lowriders than it is right now. And these lowriders, with the way they're painting the frames and the suspensions and all that, it's really hard to beat one. One, two, three, go. OK, the time has arrived. It's finally the moment for awards. Let the music play! There are many trophies, many categories, and many levels of tension here at the event. Some of the builders have worked years to get their cars to the granddaddy of them all, the Grand National Roadster Show. And our first place winner, the 73 Chevy Monte Carlo, painted orange, Luis Serrano from La Puente. Lifestyle, baby. The men from Lifestyle won big. And Pete Chapura sees why. A car guy is a car guy. Anybody that's really serious, doesn't matter whether it's a low rider, a hot rod, an off-road car, or whatever, but I think that the low rider guys actually are probably more hell-bent car people than guys I've ever met. Hey, well, actually, we did great, man. We did good. We came to a hot rod show, and just like always, man, we always sweep up. But to, to sweep up at a hot rod show is, is pretty hard to do. But as we all put together our, our effort and our work, and Getting all these cars ready for this show, I think we did pretty damn good, man. One, two, three, four. Many say it's the love of tradition that has put low riding in the forefront, featuring a culture and a fleet of cars that never went out of style. In the 70s, when tail draggers died off, low riders were still there. They were still consistent, still practicing the old trades. So now is what you've got is you've got low rider guys teaching hot rod guys and tail draggers, okay, this is how you do these crazy paint jobs. This is how you lay out the flake. And it's because they stay true to what they deemed traditional, old school low riding. So there we are, low riding at a hot rod show. It's all part of the scene here in the low life. Can't go wrong with it, low ride. But basically always show ready and you know it's always ready to go in case something comes up we're we're ready we're kings of clean there you go <laughs> this show might be your your lucky show you might take that number so. one spot i hope so i'll bless it i'll sit on yeah. it, bless it. <laughs> yeah all right <laughs>